Uh, welcome everyone. Um, so today we're really looking forward um, to this talk with Dr. Connolly. Um, Dr. Nathan Connolly is the Herbert Baxter Adams Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. He's the author of A World More Concrete, uh, Real Estate and the Remaking of Jim Crow South Florida, which has won multiple awards, including the 2014 Ken Kenneth T. Jackson Book Award from the Urban Hi History Association, the 2015 Liberty Legacy Foundation Book Award from the Organization of American Historians, among others. A World More Concrete considers the, hi the history of Jim Crow segregation in Greater Miami by embedding it in the history of capitalism and colonial and post-colonial practices. The book also engages with conflicts between tenants, urban landlords, homeowners, politicians, and property managers over how best to profit from Native Americans, Caribbean migrants, working class whites, and the Black poor. Dr. Connolly's research engages with the co-constitutions of capitalism, racism, and liberalism through an exploration of real estate, property ownership, and power. Um, helping us understand how a racial order is territorialized over time. Uh, in addition to teaching and writing, Dr. Connolly also is the co-host of the public um, radio podcast, Backstory. Um, yeah, and so with that, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Connolly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just make sure we can pull the, the screen share together um, here. Is this... Um, Hmm. There we go. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see this? All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, well, it, it, it ought to go without saying um, that I, I'm extraordinarily happy to be able to um, hang out with my my folks and friends at NYU again. Um, it was, uh, without question, um, a deeply rewarding um, year of, you know, intensive dialogue and teaching and learning uh, from my colleagues there. And, you know, many of my favorite people still call NYU home. And, and I'm, I'm very happy and, and frankly humbled to see a lot of you taking the time out um, to join the call today. I know how precious Zoom capital is in our attention spans on, like, you know, these platforms. And so... Um, you know, I, I, for one, have got my, my blue light glasses and my, my water to try to hydrate to sustain through this process, but I know how much it takes out of people to, to be engaged on this, in this way. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, I, I won't, I won't say too much in the way <clears throat> of prologue because it is, it is a, a talk that's slightly on the longer side, but I did want to just say that the pieces that I submitted, um, for the seminar, the kind of, you know, supplemental reading are, you know, both topically related to what I've discussed today relative to the current book project I'm doing on um, the article that came out in the Journal of the Gilded Age, Gilded Age and Progressive Era, but then also just thinking kind of institutionally and methodologically. So, um, you know, hopefully some of those th strains will come through and, you know, I'm very happy to have um, conversations about obviously the content of the talk, but then also, you know, the ways in which um, some of my institutional thinking is related to the longer questions um, that have been, you know, governing my work both institutionally and in print for a while. Okay, so with all that said, Mr. Connolly called about ten days ago. I saw him. He seemed well educated and extremely enthusiastic about his native land. He is colored, of course. Mr. Connolly called again this morning. Mr. Connolly has been trying Lord Reading this time. Until we hear from Jamaica, I can think of no other answer than nothing further to add. It would be just as well not to answer the letter at all, only that may bring him here again. In what was now his fourth letter to Britain's colonial office, William Smiley Connolly in late summer 1919 found himself speculating darkly. It seems as though the government would rather starve us out than repatriate us. It's probably cheaper. Known as W.S. Connolly in formal correspondence and Smiley to his friends, the man himself, after more than three months of worsening fortunes in England, could best be described as desperate. Desperation is a process. 
Smiley's early letters from May showed his address as Altgate Hotel, a handsome four-story brick establishment in a mostly German section of London. The hotel boasted a restaurant on the first level. His letters, thick with learned asides about Arawax and Oliver Cromwell, were typed on hotel stationery. And when writing to the administrative heads of the colonial office, he made sure to forward handsome notes of introduction. Enclosed, please find testimonials submitted for the purpose of securing an interview with your honor. By July, the letters had turned to being handwritten. The language had grown coarser, the paper cheap and lined, intended for those with hands in penmanship, less steadied by years of education. Smiley was indeed educated. At 38 years old, he'd become by this time an ordained Adventist minister and a graduate of Howard University, class of 1919, excuse me, of 1913. He was, by his own account, the first college graduate the Cayman Islands had produced, quote, since the beginning of recorded time, unquote. He was also now broke and had taken to living in the crowded black quarters of Limehouse, East London. After a summer spent hunting for work and giving speeches and sermons for spare change in Hyde Park, quote, it pains me to have to state the following facts. I have no money at all in England. I owe my landlady three pound food and rent. It is impossible to continue here longer, unquote. Smiley's hardship crested in the summer of 1919, or what would come to be known in the United States and elsewhere as Red Summer. With the Great War, Black subjects across the Anglo-Atlantic world followed the pull of employment and possibility into the white cities of the global north, be it Chicago, Cleveland, London, or Cardiff in Wales. Everywhere the Negroes wandered, this sojourn included segregation, low wages, high rent, and a measure of white violence. I am personally acquainted with 200 or more East Indians, West Indians, and Africans huddled together at Limehouse who are in the same and some in worse circumstances than myself. The brown-skinned men of East London swapped stories about housing and employment discrimination, about bullying from white men. There have been race riots in England and several incidents of lynching. The violence crisscrossing the Atlantic represented but one of myriad entanglements between the U.S the Caribbean and Great Britain. Smiley's challenges and travails represented another. His aspirations, professed affiliations, and persistent frustrations served to capture what Franz Fanon once described as being overdetermined from without. Overdetermined and dependent. Such represented an ongoing predicament, especially for people of color in the Anglo-Atlantic world. Landing at least seven different countries, learned in some six languages, and lettered at two universities, Howard and the University of Pennsylvania, W.S. Connolly tried and often failed to secure teaching in white collar positions, performing mostly menial work for much of his adult life. Among his labors, he sold magazine subscriptions, preached, tutored, and chauffeured, bullied out of whites only seating on Washington, D.C. streetcars protesting segregation within church conferences in Maryland, selling trinkets among the so-called Chinamen on the streets of Edinburgh, Scotland. Smiley, hither and yon, learned firsthand the limits of both subjecthood and citizenship. He trafficked in his good name and with his East London landlady and others borrowed against it. He pestered and demanded certain entitlements and declared his belonging as an upstanding British subject. He also failed over many, many years ever to shake the precarity accompanying that subjecthood. Smiley's entreaties to colonial officials, his projections of respectability and his serial needs to pull up stakes and try again were personal, but not particular to him. They were systemic, a product of history. Smiley's braided encounter with Atlantic world racisms has indeed much to teach us about his own life chances and those of his descendants. They parallel to the fate of Smiley's birthplace of Grand Cayman, and I maintain capture the colonial condition at the heart of this nation and the wider world passed down today to us. This afternoon, I submit an approach to race, place, family, and capitalism as an engagement of matters and places both big and small. My offer, an account of the colonized and ostensibly emancipated the on and offshore 
the hulking, husking structure, capitalism, and the mostly intimate and personal efforts to survive it. Those considerations begin for me in the same place and with the same person, the Cayman Islands and a single Caymanian, William Smiley Connolly, my great-grandfather. A loyal little dependency. That's what reporters in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times would come to call archipelag the arch archipelago that included Grand Cayman, Little Cayman, and Cayman Brock. It's indeed how the islanders would come to describe themselves as the 20th century contradictions of war, capitalism, and decolonization threatened to buckle the Anglo-Atlantic's imperial dominance. A loyal little dependency is also what Black subalterns like Smiley and his descendants were encouraged to exhibit if they hoped to survive the writhing white world. Migrating between Jim Crow's South and North, interwar Europe and the British Caribbean some hundred years ago, Smiley opened the circuit subsequent generations of his family course through. More, he laid down something of an Atlantic world inheritance, made equal parts from fealty and frustration, reputation and expropriation, and bonds held fast to the racist and sexist institutions chugging capitalism along. Such a confluence, what I consider a colonial confluence, demands we consider both the durability of Anglo-Atlantic racism and the bundle of strategies subaltern people developed across both space and generations. I argue indeed that even as historians rightly emphasize fluidity and contingency, there remains a certain permanence, a little loyal dependency to the ways people have ruled and survived the Anglo-Atlantic world. This, I submit further, must be counted among our many inheritances yours and mine. Now, the complexity of inheritance, material and historical, animates my current book-length project, Four Daughters, an America Story. Four Daughters takes a century-long view to help make sense of the experience of women of color in the United States during the breakthroughs and setbacks of second wave feminism, the civil rights and nuclear freeze movement, right, right to work politics, and the war on drugs. I argue that it's both possible and necessary to understand, say, the gutting of the public sector, the suburbanization of poverty, or the lingering colonial conditions suffered by people of color through a granular look at a family's encounter with America. For this book, I hone in on the lives of my mother and her three sisters, four daughters of West Indian immigrants to the US. My aim, to locate the experience of black people and principally black women as the outcome of multi-generational Atlantic world processes. And critically, again, practices of colonialism, migration, racial awakening, and attendant political retrenchments. The term four daughters refers in fact as much to actual people as to the four principal locations this family of migrants call home. It's in effect about four daughters of the Atlantic world, the greater Antilles, Western Europe, the urban Northern US, and the suburban South. Among the many sources of its inspiration, Four Daughters builds on a crucial lesson gleaned from my early work on Miami, one that I reassert mostly via implication, really exhibition this afternoon. American history, even as it happens in place, rarely happens in just one place. People cross borders and not infrequently the borders of an expanding America cross them. I discovered a decade ago that what made Miami America and what now makes the story of the Smiley family and his descendants the same, rests not on the happenings occurring within borders asserted or imagined. America resides in the stories told and struggles suffered while making sense of those happenings. Stories and struggles about education, wealth and subjecthood that even as they take roots in this land, get grafted from splinters of elsewhere. To illustrate, I recount here in three parts a rough sketch of the shifting fortunes of William Smiley Connolly and his descendants. Part one, the indebtedness of W.S. Connolly, explores Smiley's nested encounters with British racism and complex deployment of British affinity, what one might call militant subjecthood. Part two, the inheritance, details the entangled and encumbered estate and legacy Smiley left behind. Part three, unsettled accounts, locates the meeting place of land and the political culture of late capitalism, showing how migrating forms of predation and the creation of an offshore Cayman Islands remains our shared colonial burden in the here and now. So part one, 
to the indebtedness of W.S. Connolly. By the arrival of Red Summer in 1919, Smiley was already some two decades deep in stories about the dual benefits of British subjecthood and serial migration. As he told a group of segregationist American ministers in 1909, quote, if I'm not satisfied with the treatment accorded to the American Negro, I can, without the least discomfort, wend my way to a more congenial climb. That climb for him meant Britain and its colonies, quote, where every man is given a man's chance and judged on his merits as a man, unquote. Red Summer seemed to leave both Britain and Smiley changed. Soon suspected one Trinidadian who witnessed the burning and looting in Liverpool, England will be as untenable for the colored man as South Africa or the very worst state in America, unquote. Racial violence in the British Isles had gotten so deadly, colonial office bureaucrats began administering a region-wide repatriation program directed at getting black troops and merchant seamen back to their colonies of birth. Unlike in the United States, Britain had the benefit of the empire as a kind of social safety valve. White Chicagoans couldn't send black Southsiders back to say Mississippi, but the colonial and home offices of Great Britain relative to their own black populations instituted a policy aimed at precisely that. In addition to tepid defense against racial violence and blanket denials of work at Britain's various labor exchanges, English and Welsh officials withheld welfare help to any quote, Negroes, Arabs, Africans, and Malays who refused repatriation. Call it exile incentivized. Smiley thus stood among the many black Britons who preferred by midsummer to be sent out of England. But here too lay several restrictions. Only seamen or soldiers were eligible and British officials categorically denied repatriation funds to any black man married to a white woman. White women, the logic went, had no business being sent with government money into black countries. Smiley wasn't married to a white woman, at least not yet, but neither was he a soldier or a seaman. Stuck in a bureaucratic no man's land, he tried to argue past the narrowness of the repatriation policy by maintaining he'd been sent duty bound on a different mission, a different kind of mission, really a mission of faith. In a series of letters to the colonial office of Secretary of State for the Colonies and the Chief Justice of the Royal Court, he claimed to have been recruited from the United States by Mr. J. N. Ruffing of the London Chamber of Commerce. His mission was to quote, evangelize the natives in Britain's new West African possession, Togo, which had been transferred to the UK from a newly defeated Germany. In addition to convening his piety or to conveying his piety and the depth of his financial hardship, Smiley made sure too to highlight how neither he nor the many black people with whom he'd undoubtedly be associated had turned in their poverty to crime. Quote, be it said to the eternal credit of their unexampled fortitude that so far this Negro race, the most law abiding of all peoples have borne these privations unspeakable without any instance of burglary or looting, unquote. The way Smiley argued for aid bears some attention for it captures the dual qualities of black political imaginations under empire and one of the key elements that would shape subaltern claims making for generations to come. Smiley felt compelled on the one hand to fashion himself as an upstanding man of the cloth, as a man educated, loyal, and on some higher mission. On the other hand, like the average sailor or doughboy, it was in answering his country's call that he now fell in need of support. Loyal, respectable, and elevated in his use of language, Smiley closed every letter with the same acceptable bourgeois epistolary convention, tellingly one of submission. Quote, your obedient servant, unquote. At the same time though, and sometimes in the very same letters, Smiley attempted too to coerce, especially as the months dragged on, his desperation deepened, and aid remained beyond his grasp. Quote, the government is sowing seeds of its own disintegration in its treatment of the dark races, Smiley cautioned. Given no choice, black, Britain's black residents might be forced to attack the colonial system itself. Then, Smiley warned, again quoting, we would for the first time be branded Bolsheviks, unquote. In the face of ongoing employment discrimination, Smiley simmered, again quoting, we are finding out that loyalty and patriotism do not pay. Thus in his apparent time of need, again quoting, I want no more evasive letters. I want either work, money, or definite instructions given where I may apply with assurance for repatriation 
and adequate resettlement allowance. And he was sure to add, quote, I want that at once, unquote. What response did such thundering receive at the colonial office? I am afraid he is lying. This short, almost clinical sentence, scrawled inter-office correspondence, stopped me cold a couple of years ago as I researched Smiley's case in the National Archives at Kew in Richmond, Greater London. Among the various notations and marginalia that accompany my great-grandfather's eloquent smoldering letters, there bled these cynical statements from colonial officials or minor factual inconsistencies on Smiley's part. Here, a date where he claimed something had happened conflicted in two other different letters. There, blocks of time and circumstance relative to how Smiley was able to support himself would remain curiously unaccounted for. Quote, I can find no one who knows anything of Mr. Ruffin or the supposed mission to the USA, unquote. Smiley claimed in July 1919 to have come to London from America on a missionary invitation, but clerks could then furnish a May 1919 letter in which Connolly professed to be a new arrival from Cayman, come to Britain to raise money for education in his homeland. He professed in those earlier visits to need 1,000 pounds to build a public education system for Cayman, and clerks and military officials would again and again come away from these letters with conflicting accounts. Each of these elicited, in my own mind, tiny barbs of doubt, and I became desperate to separate fact from fiction. And of course, desperation is a process. And he has the nerve to call himself reverend. It was around December of 1919 that officials in the colonial office seemed to have cracked some riddle. He stated originally that he was, to, he was here to represent the interests of Grand Cayman, then he came over as a result of an invitation to colored young men in America given by Mr. Ruffin. Now we know the real reason, though I never suspected it, I must admit. According to reports from the office of Jamaica's governor and the regional commissioner in the Cayman Islands, quote, immediately before his last departure from this island, Cayman, Mr. Connolly was the defendant in an action to recover damages for seduction. Following a trial, Quote, a jury of his fellow islanders assessed damages at 100 pound and not having the wherewithal to satisfy the judgment debt, Mr. Connolly left the island, unquote. Grand Cayman's commissioner then professed that, I am, I am credibly informed that repeated efforts on his behalf to compromise a matter with the judgment creditor have been unavailing. It's completely possible that any charges following Smiley could have been bogus. Seduction in the empire could at times refer to forms of political indoctrination. Smiley was an educator after all. However, given the precarity of women in general and women on the black fringes of the British empire in particular, the charge of seduction could have been more than valid. It could have indeed been a euphemism for some pretty wicked business. Smiley's own mother, Elizabeth Marion Wood was married at the age of 12, bore him, her second child, at age 14, and after three more children, totaling five, she was dead at age 35. The Cayman Islands of the Victorian era was no paradise for women. At perhaps its most benign, seduction, even when consensual between intimate partners, represented an infraction against the ownership rights of fathers over their daughters a deflowered woman having been seduced was damaged property, hence the 100 pound in damages. The facts of the case remain a site of my most furious and still most fruitless digging. I can say with certainty that with these discovered charges, any hope Smiley held for securing government aid had evaporated. His many months of self-presentation and crafted indignation had been undone. And where exactly, in light of the seduction judgment, was Connolly trying to get back to? The Cayman Islands were as remote a corner of the British Empire as one could find. One measured distance, not just in miles, but in the number of steps one had to take to get to a place from the administrative heart of empire. Smiley described Cayman as the little island asleep on the edges of the Indies, where she has slept for centuries, unknown to the outside world and to that world unknown, unquote. He racked up debts trying to get to and from that distant place. He borrowed money from the Seventh-day Adventist church, borrowed money from his father. 
He ultimately borrowed from the British government as well. An entry in the catalog of Britain's National Archive captured in ways I simply could not approve, improve upon. Quote, the indebtedness of W.S. Connolly. That's a catalog entry at Q. In an economy of debt, one's word, one's reputation was quite literally currency. Smiley was slated to face his debt in Grand Cayman by way of the HMS Changanola. The boat, he never got on the boat, however, choosing instead to hop a vessel to France in 1921. This is a ship manifest and you can see, um, where is it, which line from the, ah, yeah. So the fourth strike through from the bottom, W.S. Connolly teacher, age 40. So he went instead to France in 1921. Okay, yeah. There in Paris, William Smiley Connolly engaged and eventually married Rachel Aimé Dubuis. A white woman born in the city of lights, Rochelle had been raised in a convent and met Smiley through a mutual acquaintance. Smiley had taken to performing jazz in Paris's nightclubs and was taking piano lessons with the woman who would ultimately introduce him to his wife. The pair would travel to Cayman by way of Cuba in 1924 and live by turns between Kingston and Grand Cayman, surviving in the early going, largely off of Smiley's occasional teaching gigs and Rochelle's skills embroidering for white Caribbean elites of both islands. In spite of his college degree, perhaps at times even because of it, Smiley found himself constantly frustrated by walls, stumbling blocks, and ceilings placed between him and more secure professional prospects. Everything from his uncommon credentials to his white wife seemed to be at issue. In short order, Smiley and Rochelle had three and then four children. Reginald, my grandfather, Michelle, France, the only daughter, and Daniel. Rochelle, perhaps as a consequence of the repatriation restrictions on white British women, was one of very few working class white women living with a black family in Kingston. By the time he reached his mid-50s, Smiley had come to regard British fair play as the permission to, quote, bow gracefully and say as little as possible about it, unquote. Civil society and the island economy held together mostly through good word, contracts, imperial manners, and interpersonal shows of generosity. That meant, <clears throat> excuse me, white settlers largely setting the rules. Cayman in the 1930s in particular had been a frozen in time, cash poor, bartering kind of place. Let's back up for a second. Banks would not even arrive for another 20 years. Smiley in 1934 noted that the the toll of the lack of transparency in the islands took on his family. Quote, my wife and children have had to drink to the bitterest dregs a cup of misery and semi-starvation, and the end is not yet. Desperation is a process. The next several years saw Connolly again performing odd jobs and writing occasional columns for the Daily Gleaner, the island's national newspaper. As one could expect, his columns seemed at times to be those of a man educated well beyond his station. References to Virgil's Aeneid, translated from the Latin, would accompany Smiley's reporting on civil servant meetings. Discussions about needed infrastructure in Cayman seemed to require mentions of Castilian conquerors and Diogenes the Cynic and other conjured elements from antiquity. With British officials excluding black people from all salary teaching posts in the colonies, Smiley taught privately. Poverty across Cayman and Jamaica had taught, had, had him being paid in domestic labor from students, chickens, and in ground provisions. Smiley also preached on more than a few occasions, eventually in 1931, taking up residence in a two-room rectory at a church in Kingston. In spite of being more traveled and educated than his supervising white pastor, Smiley could never be more than the assistant pastor. Preserving a scrap of his respect, perhaps he advertised his occasions in the pulpit with flyers depicting him 20 years younger in his Howard graduation robes. Again, likely written by him, some of these advertisements referred to Smiley as Professor Connolly. Ongoing frustrations with his post in the church drove Smiley to leave Jamaica yet again for Cayman. There, students recounted a quote-unquote odd fellow at once at home and out of place. This is one of his students quoting, we didn't like him too much, he was foreign to us, unquote. 
With no medical training to speak of, he'd bought a discounted dental chair and other implements, mail order from Japan. Then he learned from a friend, a fellow Howard graduate, how to pull teeth for money. Part two, the inheritance. The man they called Smiley died in February, 1938 on an operating table in Kingston, Jamaica. His stomach cancer discovered only weeks earlier was quickly deemed inoperable by a doctor in the Cayman Islands where he lived with his wife and children. In Cayman, there had been no public hospital. Instead, a British heiress had paid to build a four bed emergency ward and dispensary meant to serve the island's 6,500 residents. Four beds for more than 6,000. Such insufficiency, like a mail order dentist, represented the pinnacle of healthcare at the edge of empire. Kingston served as the administrative hub of the British West Indies and was thus the closest option. In excruciating pain, Smiley boarded a vessel on the Samboko shipping line to begin the three-day trip some 200 miles between Cayman and Jamaica. The doctor was advising me not to go, he admitted in this letter. Yet to stay here without treatment means death. The doctor strongly predicts my death on the voyage up. I, of course, don't believe any such thing, unquote. Should he die en route, Smiley averred, his wife would cover his fare. He also asked the Samboko captain that should his death occur, quote, my express desire is that I be buried at sea, unquote. Smiley detailed how much canvas and rope was needed to bury him in the seaman's way. He explained further, in case this money for materials isn't sufficient, I shall pay the difference tomorrow eve. Days later, having landed at Kingston, William Smiley Connolly perished, indebted. He remains buried in an unmarked grave. Five days later, Rochelle gave birth to their fifth child, Gabriel. Smiley left behind more than just a child unseen, however, much more. Alongside the letter concerning his burial arrangements, Smiley wrote a will. In it, he conferred, quote, to my wife, Rochelle Marguerite Connolly, all my household furniture and dental instruments, together with my land property at Georgetown, unquote. He gave her to all my property at East End with the express proviso, however, that should she desire to sell in any way to dispose of the lands at East End, she should first communicate with each of my brothers separately. Cecil, Luther, and Bunyan, and get their individual reply before disposing of such lands." Unquote. Smiley maintained, I desire them to have the first opportunity of purchasing said lands so as to keep our family estate unbroken. The estate was over 100 acres. Captain John Cornelius, Smiley's father, and it perhaps bears repeating, husband to a 12-year-old, was also one of the largest landowners on the island of Grand Cayman. He had apparently been disappointed with his son's decision to run off to college in America. He'd hoped Smiley would have pursued the family tradition of becoming a mariner. As punishment, he gave Smiley and his three brothers who'd followed him to Howard the worst kind of land, sandy, rocky, and upon which no food could grow. Coastal land, over 100 acres of it. Now, before we get too excited, recall it's 1938. Cayman was still a three-day boat ride from Jamaica away. The land was there, but no one could do anything with it, really. This hardship would make Rochelle's story at least as remarkable as Smiley's. She would remain in Kingston, settling on the poor waterfront among the fishmongers just outside the prison on Tower Street. There, she raised her now five children alone on a seamstress's income. She performed embroidery, mostly for Jamaica's wealthy British expatriates and governors. She also taught French to the children of the island's small white bourgeoisie, working retail too on the side. From gig to gig, she juggled precarity and a commitment to preserving a respectable household. More than once, her eldest son recalled, people were telling us that she should give us up for adoption, but she absolutely refused. That son, Naldi, eventually met Sherry, who lived in a rooming house she and the Connollys mutually occupied in Kingston. The two fell in love, married in Jamaica, endured a forced annulment from Sherry's mother and ran off to England in 1950 only to marry again. Their migration rhymed in a way with that of Smiley some three decades earlier. 
for London would be for them, but the first stop in a decidedly Atlantic story that would take them not just from the Caribbean to England in the 1950s, but on to New England in the 1960s and to South Florida in the late 1970s. When the couple left Jamaica for England in 1950, they became part of the Windrush migration. Shortly after World War II, thousands of West Indians flocked from the empire to London, Liverpool, and elsewhere in Britain to take advantage of labor shortages in nursing and shipping and industrial sectors. Most settled in Kensington, Brixton, and other burgeoning West Indian neighborhoods where the city's real estate speculators seizing an opportunity began cultivating a cluster of bounded enclaves for black occupancy. Some 70 different real estate companies carved up large family homes into flats and began harvesting high rents from new Caribbean arrivals. But Sherry and Naldi were not among them. Sherry had secured a nursing assignment in Warwick, some two hours north of London. There she had made white friends and through those associations sidestepped the usual barriers facing black Londoners when she moved into the city, Fulham to be exact. Fulham was a white neighborhood where the groceries were more affordable and of higher quality. You were never going to find ackee and saltfish, and as a black person, you could certainly expect to get the occasional menacing glance or comment about your being out of place. None of this, however, seemed to outweigh the happiness of a studio apartment with roof views of the city. From Fulham, Sherry and Naldi entertained their friends where they could and perhaps believe themselves safe from certain black hardships. Even as they pursued a hoped for future in a far off place, Sherry and Naldi lived in a world in which race-based forms of economic predation would literally follow people of color into the cities they chose to call home. Crossing the Atlantic to Britain allowed Sherry to attend nursing school, work in a government hospital, and secure that all-important shield of the middle class, a British pension. Naldi joined the Merchant Marine, the latest in a long line of mariners in his Caymanian family. That both could cross London's color lines represented another level of movement in their migration. To go one step further, that Sherry and Naldi were British subjects at all mattered greatly in their ability to move to London in the first place. Since all Smiley's days of dissemblance, this much was true. British subjecthood in the UK and around the world gave many black immigrants a measure of cultural protection that comparatively black Americans didn't have in say South Carolina or that Haitians didn't seem to have anywhere. Naldi traveled the world for several years as part of Her Majesty's Merchant Marine. He fed his love of poetry and subversive literature at libraries at various ports of call. Then he returned to London. From there, he and Sherry traveled through France with friends and started a family, two children. The Connollys left London in 1958 and settled in New London, Connecticut. At Terrace, sorry, at Four Terrace Avenue, they, ha they had two more children. Four daughters, Deanne, Tammy, Tracy, and Danielle. And, you know, basically going across the picture here, um, the one next to the collie uh, from the rear is my mother, Deanne, followed by Tammy. Danielle is in uh, Sherry's arms, my grandmother, and then the person being bit by the dog in the foreground is my aunt, Tracy. <laughs> um, Rochelle followed the scattering of her children as they moved from Jamaica to France to England to the promise of the United States, eventually moving with her son, now the Sherry and the children in 1963 in Connecticut. Rochelle and my grandmother became especially close. The pair spoke for years about their own experiences married to challenging men. Tough times could be made all the tougher if a husband struggled to fight employment discrimination, struggled with mental health, or just plain struggled. There was no room for militant subjecthood when children needed school clothes. Past stories of odd Smiley and his many jobs became much sharper narratives about now these inherited manic depression. Grandma's British pension, which she'd earned as a nurse in the National Health Service, would wind up saving the family from complete ruin, even in America. The process of intergenerational learning would also continue apace, both in positive and negative ways. Admonitions in America seemed little different than those swapped between Caribbean cosmopolitans living under empire. Protect your family name, get an education, seek out the recommendation of respectable members of society. So informed by the world as it was, my grandmother told me herself years later, recounting a lesson she tried to impart to her girls, quote, to make it in America, you must marry a man who is either white 
rich or educated, unquote. The question, of course, is why such colonial values leave one so well served in America. Smiley had been plenty educated, but he was just too black and at the wrong time, no less. My grandfather was plenty handsome and light skinned, and he had, but he had an eighth grade education at best. And my grandmother swore that her own precarity came from not following her own advice, really her mother's advice. Her children were similarly stubborn. Her eldest, my mother, by grandma's telling, found the poorest, blackest, most uneducated man she could find. The scandal of it in the context of New London's small, whispering middle class literally drove my grandmother to flee to Florida in 1976. Three kids and a husband in tow. I was born in 1977, incidentally. Mom, disavowed and pregnant, holed up in New London with the boyfriend. Now, su such occurrences must be considered part of our Atlantic world inheritance. Without the freedom and security to withdraw from the workings of a colonial and post-colonial situation, security starts with the only thing you ever really own outright, which is your name. Then from there, you have to hook your fortunes onto something, even if that meant the institutions of patriarchy and white supremacy. Universities, the Merchant Marine, the National Health Service, the Adventist Church, these and more were the vessels of aspirations. Letters of recommendation were one's freedom papers. The country couldn't promise you benefits, a home, a future. All you got at best under our Atlantic democracies was an invitation to apply. To be clear, the preservation of reputation or good name became an inheritance, a gift from the colonial to the supposedly post-colonial world. And it was a totalizing inheritance. Everything from kitchen table wisdom to racial uplift projects, to the Byzantine determinations of credit or bond ratings for debtor states and municipalities stayed tethered to reputation. To be clearer still, whether we're talking about people or territories, white power sets the terms of respectability and reputation. White power in terms of who gets what, who can move where, and what counts as history versus what's merely the past. All of this shapes political pragmatism, commercial common sense, and at even the most intimate level, the codes of conduct people elect to follow or as parents pass on to their children. Consider this as we return to Grand Cayman, Smiley's old homeland, to unravel the intimate and international entanglement of our colonial inheritance. From the 1890s through Smiley's death and into the 1950s, Anglo-Atlantic concerns with Cayman remained relegated to shipments of turtle meat, rum, and other exotic consumables. The country's most urban area, Georgetown, pictured here, didn't even have 24-hour electrical service. Then began in the 1950s, fresh investment from England, a kind of perhaps colonial Keynesianism. Not unlike pro-growth spending that turned the U.S. South's cotton belt into the Sun Belt, strategic spending from Britain went to infrastructure instead of social services. An airport in 1952, then the island's first bank. This represented part of a broader post-war effort to modernize the empire. In the decade that followed World War II, Britain's own reputation as a world power had begun to decline. The 1957 crisis in Suez especially turned Britain's geopolitical missteps into a frenzy of speculation against the British pound. To stabilize their currency, British officials began using the US dollar for its foreign transactions, imposing strict restrictions on the use of the British pound in international trade. So began the so-called Euro market. Not long after, British bankers began trafficking in foreign monies, they soon discovered important tax loopholes. Because foreign currency trading occurred neither in England nor as trade at coastal customs houses, currency trading at colonial banks remained both tax-free and exempt from tariffs. Other banks in Asia, Europe, and the US soon set up their own exchanges in the empire, followed by a slew of other no and low tax financial services, flags of convenience for luxury boats, offshore trusts, hedge funds, and captive insurance. What's been called the second British empire, an empire of finance, would effectively turn the white man's burden into white capitals offshore. Alongside sites in the Seychelles, British Virgin Islands, Jersey, and elsewhere, Cayman quickly became home to shell companies, 
from across the globe. Lawyers from Britain, the US and Canada joined the architects of growth in Grand Cayman to assure the complete absence of taxes on income, property, capital transfers, corporate profit and inheritance. Investors across the Anglo-Atlantic soon set up trusts where they transferred income, capital gains and preserved estates. Thanks in part to Cayman, all inheritance would not be created or sheltered equal. Through the 1970s, American money that would have been taxed to pay for any number of services and public goods inside the United States moved instead as debt and stock into the offshore slipstream. Cash-strapped cities like New York and Chicago struggled to fund education and social services. The urban crisis, it seemed, would have at least one foot offshore. Then there was the lingering colonial condition writ large. As much of the rest of the world decolonized in the late 1950s and early 1960s, the Cayman Islands remained England's obedient servant. The old Connolly homeland offered anxious investors from the United States and the United Kingdom projections of a white political culture, really a white regulatory climate. We've grown quite comfortable describing late capitalism as a critical site of discontinuity, the birthplace of so-called neoliberalism. Yet contrary to our predisposition for tales of rupture, Anglo-Atlantic capital in the, in the 1960s and 70s pursued a certain administrative and racial continuity, one that the Cayman Islands uniquely provided. Cayman, Union Jack a flutter, had become, had become the colony for decolonizing times. Beginning in the early 1960s, concerns about the arrival of black majority governments in the Caribbean struck the financial sector as an unnecessary instability. Thus whole sectors of the financial industry picked up and left decolonizing countries in the Antilles, Jamaica in 1962, Bahamas in 1973, and Bermuda in 1979, all suffered a massive exodus of Anglo-American financial centers for the Cayman Islands. In short order, Cayman became the largest holder of US securities in the world, home to 60% of global hedge fund assets. One address in Georgetown served in 2008 as home for nearly 19,000 separate companies, each one marked only by a brass plate mounted on a lobby wall. One looks to Cayman to cut the costs on an affluent life. The Trump administration's Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, owns a yacht registered in the Cayman Islands. Actually, she and her family own 10 yachts. Flying a Caymanian flag on just one of the family's 10 yachts saved the DeVos estate some $2.4 million in taxes and countless other dollar costs and ununionized offshore crew, late, crew costs. After some 500 years, pirates, it seems, found fresh ways to bury their treasure in the Cayman Islands. A swashbuckling world of buried iron chests and wooden ships and steel sabers gave way to a legion of 20th and 21st century buccaneers wielding gutted regulations, accountability loopholes, and a fistful of financial services. Final section, part three, unsettled accounts. And thank you all for, for staying with me. The late 1970s would be no less embedded for the Connollys who settled in Greater Miami, now their fourth stop in the Atlantic world. Miami, like the wider Sunbelt South, was in the throes of becoming the post-colonial world city. During the 1960s, becoming global meant taking down the overt markers of Jim Crow and replacing wooden slums with concrete expressways. It meant placating the poor with token projects built far from view, sometimes in fact under the very infrastructure intended to whisk suburbanites tourists and investors around the region. It meant ribbon cuttings and interracial congratulations. And it meant the rapid expansion of suburbs to draw people away from cities with the lure of good schools, safe streets, and low taxes. In leaving New London, Sherry and Naldi became part of a great migration that between 1970 and 1995 saw 7 million black people move to American suburbs. That 7 million was nearly double the number of African-Americans that moved into cities following World War II. And yet, as with urbanization, the realities of racial segregation, this time fueled largely by the explosion of private schools and white flight, ensure that African descended people would continue to provide the cash that would fuel white America. Now, 
Historians have only recently taken to exploring the economic difficulties of the white middle class and what they faced in the 1970s. We're now about 10 years really into this historiographical intervention, which has been quite robust. An even less appreciated aspect of the story though, is that as white families' capacity to secure a living wage shrank, white ownership of black communities actually grew. White people didn't just move out, white capital moved in. Jim Crow or no, Rancher capitalism was something that you could depend on. It too was loyal. In the Connolly, South Florida of the 1970s, over 90% of black occupied housing in the suburb of Liberty City was owned by whites. That represented a 20% increase over what white ownership was in Miami's black downtown three decades earlier during the height of Jim Crow. The same suburbs, in other words, that seemed to promise black Americans and immigrants ownership and its accompanying autonomy increasingly became racially contained rental markets beset by ramped up policing, reduced availability of quality food, and a reduction of basic services. But such evaporating promised lands represented only one side of this America story. Cayman too remained bound to this process. With the arrival of offshoring, real estate markets in the island boomed. Bankers and their allies wrote new housing and occupancy codes into law. Many of these proved so strict and expensive, they prevented working class residents from meeting them. The result deepened forms of predatory real estate speculation as families strangled by costly building codes surrendered lands that had been in their families for generations. The real estate pages of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times boasted advertisements declaring the liquidation of 70 year old estates and touting quote, the British crown colony that is of course, quote, 100% tax free. While the regulations would ultimately be repealed, land law, like the Euro market or the expansion of hedge funds, created another site of frenzied profiteering not easily halted. Land in Cayman was never abundant, but it was not valuable because historically the island had been more outward facing than agricultural. Rocky red and yellow soils riddled with unwieldy chunks of limestone made plows on the island almost as useful, useless as a college degree from the United States. Some of you who know my earlier work in Miami may recall how the scarcity of black housing made Negro tenements both high profit and low value. They were a site of exorbitant rents, but little equity. Scarcity in that instance and this had to be produced. The beach in Cayman, even if people owned parts of it, had to be turned into an asset. Family held titles had to be consolidated. It took the work of bankers, draftsmen, and speculators working themselves into a lather to turn land, once considered merely rare, a statement of geographic fact, into that which was scarce, a pressing financial concern among the investor class. Now, y'all are probably wondering what happened to those 100 acres, I know. Um, they're still in the family. However, after Smiley and his four brothers had umpteen kids and even more grandkids, the land has no clear title and is buried against use under more than $50,000 in legal fees alone. As in 1938, it is another illiquid asset, though worth way more now than then, of course. In light of that inheritance, my grandparents bought their home in Miramar, Miramar Florida, becoming the first black family to move onto their block in 1979. It was a three bedroom, two bath house for $73,000. Rochelle moved in, that's her picture there in the middle, and lived there to the ripe old age of 100. That's me, by the way, to the far end with the clip on tie, which I don't have anymore. <laughs> now, one old white lady was not enough to stave off the inevitability of white flight. One white family after another fled and the neighborhood became increasingly Haitian and West Indian. By the mid 1990s, it had become affordable enough that their daughter, my mother, could buy a house just one street over. The proximity was nice, but the reality was that between my grandparents and their children, there was no discernible upward mobility. Neighborhood property values had topped out, especially once the cheaper real retail shops moved in. By the year 2000, after more than 20 years of mortgage payments, my grandparents had knocked less than $9,000 off the principal. With no equity accruing, home repairs went on credit cards. Funds to pay for one child's drug rehabilitation 
came from my grandmother's personal retirement. College unfinished, condos foreclosed. Now the who struggled his whole adult life with manic depression, had trouble holding a job and Sherry, a registered nurse, made ends meet with her government job in, in a state hospital and later through two trustee pensions, one from Britain and one from the state of Florida. Her kids knew this magic only as the money tree, unquote. Before she died in 2006, my grandmother from her breakfast table regaled me with her imperial lessons about reputation, education, and the right kind of people. She would sometimes lament too how Jamaica gave up the benefits of subjecthood. And she would always point to K-Man as proof of Jamaica's folly. Enveloping the lessons and laments would be mentions of past idyllic Caribbean life and occasionally images of Smiley. In the photo album, wearing a kilt, on a wall framed in poster size, playing the drums, in the grainy newsprint picture on mom's dresser. How many languages did he speak again? Was it true he was manic too, like grandpa? With such speculations, no surprise came talk of the inheritance. They're selling land in Cayman by the square foot, you know. Experts brag today about the end of geography or the fictitious spaces of the offshore, as if places like Grand Cayman or even the wider Caribbean don't really exist. We could stand to remember though that capitalism, even finance capitalism, happens in place, two places, and two people. Grand Cayman today is not just a land of file cabinets or computer terminals, it's lost land holdings and empty mansions on top of those holdings. It's the highest per capita incarceration rate outside of Russia. Really, it's the land upon which we now remain deeply and desperately dependent, in spite of barely acknowledging its existence, people, or history. Rather than ignore from here in America, the history, our history, happening offshore, we would do well to shelter and honor that inheritance, our inheritance. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Now, some of you may um, recognize parts of that from the piece that was in the Gilded Age essay. Um, so if you, you're welcome to raise questions coming out of that or, you know, um, obviously what, what I just spent the last near hour uh, talking about. Kimani. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Connolly, for your talk. It was really amazing. I have two questions. Um, one relating to what you kind of alluded to at the end in regards to subjecthood. So you talked about how Smiley um, for your grandmother kind of like represented the benefits of subjecthood. So I just wanted to know if you could kind of dig into that a little bit deeper, specifically because it's really interesting to think of black immigrant people, black people from the colonies going to London prior to World War II, because that's not really something that's talked about. More people talk about Windrush. So I would like to hear how you, and how you talked about how he was struggling and things of that nature, but at the same time, he was able to traverse across the Atlantic in ways that many other black people in the world couldn't. So I wanna hear if you could talk a little bit more about these, this relationship with subjecthood that black immigrant people, black people from the colonies had and also, your second half of your presentation was really interesting, uh, talking about how Cayman became this place of like financial capital and like how it's kind of like where the treasure is buried. And I want to see if you could, or I want to hear how you put that in conversation with how, while this is happening to Cayman, all these newly independent Black republics are getting indebted to the IMF and World Bank at the same time. So I think that's like a really, these are really interesting things that are happening and really interconnected. I just want to hear like your expertise and like what your research is showing you. Yeah, yeah, and no, I, I appreciate that. Um, so um, it's, it's not, it's funny because you know, as, as I've looked at the secondary literature on this, um, you know, you have folks like Rena Goldthree at Princeton, you have, um, you know, a number of, of books that are looking specifically at like Red Summer 1919, which for me, you know, when I first came to the project was a real revelation 
that there was this transnational, you know, Red Summer that clearly was coming out of existing patterns of migration and, and you know, labor competitions and residential competitions. And, you know, being able to locate, um, you know, my great grandfather in the National Archives in like, you know, these extraordinarily well preserved, bounded, cataloged, you know, tomes, you know, that the colonial office pulls together. You know, I mean, you, you read through these volumes and it's just one episode after another of folks who are trying to figure out like what exactly does it mean to be a British subject and, you know, to demand British justice. So there, there's an argument that's being made. And there's actually a book of, about this period, a blank on the author now, um, sadly, but basically it's called We Demand British Justice. And it's about these claims that are being made. And, you know, you can look at the work of someone like C.L.R. James when he's, you know, in Beyond a Boundary or, you know, some of the early Garvey, you know, when he's migrating to England before he comes to the United States. And there is this, there is this sense that people are going to make good on the kind of merit-based um, discourse that is seemingly, you know, chugging along the white man's burden, right? Like if we simply follow what we're told to follow, if we become articulate, if we become, you know, conversant in European languages, if we learn about, you know, the daffodils, right? It's like all, all, all of this is um, a kind of precondition for belonging. And so then to see the, the frustration that grows out of not allowing uh, black people to kind of get full, you know, benefits from this bargain that they've made um, ends up being a, a, a very important variable, and and I and I am noticing at least that it, it not, it's not just important for the history of Britain, but then it's important for the kind of militancy that comes, you know, to Jamaica in like the 30s. So it's it's through the return of many of these folks, and this is the part I'm still trying to figure out causally, right? It's like what you get in the in, in the mid 30s rebellions are actually a lot of people who were formerly in England, who are now coming back and like, you know, trying to figure out like, okay, there's no jobs here either. And like, what does this mean? And, you know, the kind of depression era hardship that they're experiencing now with clearly no real relief. Um, so to me, it's, it's a very important way of, you know, one understanding like what's happening in terms of the political economy of the progressive era world and, and, and how, it, how better served are we by thinking about the Red Summer moment and you know the Progressive Era, you know, in the Roaring Twenties moment, you know, in, in on a, at a big scale, even if it's individuals, we're kind of following as they move along. And that's that's definitely the, the, a critical piece of it. Um, you know, the other thing for me is you know to have uh, a way of understanding the generational learning piece of it. This this is 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 you know the, one of the biggest, I hope at least, analytic payoffs of the project is, you know, not, it's not enough to simply talk about kind of political ideologies or, you know, people who are reading certain political tracts and then they become radicalized. But like, what happens when somebody starts their life as a kind of loyal subject and through the aging process actually becomes more radical and then passes, you know, their lessons on to their children that they, they maybe carry it further. Like, this is something that we haven't really thought through because, I mean, some of you know this really well, like, only in the last 20 years have we really started doing, you know, biography that's not the kind of canonical figures of like the civil rights or black freedom struggle, right? We've got really good work now about Aslanda Robeson, and we've got great work about Fannie Lou Hamer and Bayard Rustin and these folks. But what does it mean to still do kind of non-elite collective biographies where the life cycle actually has political consequences and economic consequences? So that's, that's part of what I'm trying to pull together now and why even though my project is largely about women in the late 20th century, I had to begin with basically the failed patriarch of the first half of the, of the 20th century, because one of the threads that continues to come up is like, you know, <laughs> people who, you know, kind of sign on to elements of the marriage contract or the patriarchy as lived and experienced, and then they don't get what they expect out of that contractual arrangement, right? So, you know, those of you who are familiar with the work of someone like Phyllis Schlafly, for example, and how, you know, she was really effective at demobilizing, you know, popular um, um, efforts to get an equal rights amendment in the 1970s. So much of her argument, the conservative argument was that women gain strength and leverage and negotiating power through the marriage contract. And so therefore we need to lean into that as a way to really ensure that gender relations will in fact be um, respected as opposed to eviscerating, you know, different and eviscerating women's household claims. Well, there, there are, are, again, not, ideologues like Schlafly necessarily, but just everyday folk who are like, yeah, coupling is important, building a household is important, the marriage, right? And the expectation of like the breadwinner, 
you know, again, to look at, you know, the work of someone like, um, you know, Robert Self who wrote about this really compellingly, right? You, you, when you sign up for the breadwinner approach, if that breadwinner ain't bringing in bread, what are the consequences there? Right? How, how, does that, how does that impact folks in the 70s and 80s who think back, like, not only is my father not doing well, but his father's not doing well. And like, that ends up shaping a lot of what then becomes the more intimate political, you know, questions um, in the household. So the other question, the bigger question about just like thinking through the, the post-independence Caribbean, um, you know, this is an area that, you know, I'm, I'm very much in the kind of throes of now in terms of trying to figure out like what to do with Jamaica in particular, like, you know, where the family has left Jamaica, but they still have letters that are showing up in the gleaner. And there's still a sense of like, you know, needing to send provisions to Jamaica. And there's still, you know, family members who have land there. And like, so there, there's, again, there's a relationship, not just in the terms of, of you know, the, the ones that you outlined about like the IMF and the World Bank, but again, that financial hardship means that resources in the terms of remittances are going to be sent to certain places and not others, right? I can't go to Cayman because I can't afford it because the, the, the dollar is so inflated there, but I can go to Jamaica and, you know, kind of have a certain kind of, you know, impact as a, as a migrant coming back and being a, a patron of sorts. And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's I mean, there, there's a great documentary, Life and Debt, that you can see that gives you, you know, a, 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 a good schematic of the period and some of the, the unique challenges that were faced by Jamaica through the 70s, especially. But, um, you know, I think for me, at least at this stage, I'm trying to, you know, tack back and forth between the big question of like, okay, what does, um, you know, austerity mean at the level of like household budgeting in the diaspora? And, 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 is, there, and is there a way to make those kinds of, you know, connections really clear, um, you know, in ways that might hopefully, I don't know, be of some import to like a broader immigration conversation um, and the like. So, you know, the, the, the honest answer to your question is I need to, to do more to figure out exactly like which, key moments in structural adjustment really did precipitate greater or lesser hardship. But I do know, at least for me, that the scale at which I want to try to evidence, you know, that hardship is, is one that is both, you know, macro, but also deeply granular. Thank you. Sure. I'm assuming folks use the, the hand raise feature here on the, okay. Mike. Uh, hi, Dr. Connolly. Thanks again for, uh, for coming and delivering this talk. Uh, it's so fascinating to hear uh, about this work and about this, um, you know, the, the incredible um, family story that you've, that you've brought. Um, in, in thinking about, I have two questions. In, in, in thinking about a, a figure like, um, you know, William Smiley Connolly, I'm, I'm, um, I, I could not help but think about um, uh, William Henry Ellis, uh, who's the, this um, figure that um, Carl Jacoby uh, just wrote this biography of. He's a, um, uh, you know, ex-slave in Texas who um, poses as a Mexican in order to become kind of this Wall Street financier. Um, and thinking about uh, this, this theme that you discussed, um, the idea of freedom papers, of having kind of institutional connections and hooking your name onto something. Um, I'm thinking about the way that um, um, borders kind of um, operate in, in, in your work. We, you know, we have a lot of conversations going on now about, you know, how, you know, states and nations um, create these borders, imperial borders, racial borders. Um, but it, it occurs to me that there's, um, there's also these very interesting stories um, of, uh, you know, folks that are able to um, cross borders and in doing so, um, they're able to kind of, um, you know, establish new attachments to their names and new um, uh, affiliations. And I'm wondering if, if the theme of border crossing is something that you're thinking about because it's also, um, right, capital also takes on different characteristics when it's, when it's crossing borders. Um, um, and then a, a, just a small question, uh, and this is, this is a little out of left field, but um, I noticed in the, um, in the land, land titles that um, 
uh, the land in Grand Cayman uh, is adjacent to land that's owned by the Church of Latter-day Saints. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, you know anything about that uh, and about that, that kind of transnational history in Islands. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll start on, on, on the second question first. Um, I actually delivered this talk at BYU. Um, and, they, and, they, and they totally like latched onto that. And like, whoa, the Mormons are like in Cayman too. And I'm like, yeah, these cats are everywhere. Um, and I don't, I don't, I have not done the field work part to, to, to see like, one, does the Church of Latter-day States still, still own that land or what might have happened to it? But, I, but I, I too noticed that you have churches, and this is, you know, true in Cayman, and, but it's also true in Jamaica where the Adventist church and, you know, they're doing like missionary work with the natives, like in the, you know, hills of Jamaica, right? That like the clearly American churches are deeply invested in the Caribbean. And that is, that is a story that has to completely, you know, be integral to this because one of the things that is becoming clear to me is I basically have to become conversant in like institutional histories of the National Health Service, Merchant Marine, University, like all these institutions, because these are the methods through which people are able to do these migrations. So in some ways, it, it, it circles back to Kimani's point um, about like, you know, the, the mobility is not simply about somebody who had a hankering to move, right? It's actually about like what institutions facilitated that movement. And so the, the I mean, the Latter-day Saints, as we know, they've been there everywhere, literally everywhere. Um, and they're the global operation presently at BYU. I mean, it, it eclipses, you know, yeah, I mean, they have, they have like a five-story multimedia like complex. Like they have their own cable news network. I mean, they're they're they're, they're real, the real deal. So um, so yeah, so all that to say that like being able to figure out the theological, institutional, and economic elements of that um, is really important for me. Um, and you know, I don't know the specific life cycle of that piece, but definitely that's on the the, the agenda to figure out. Um, the border the border question is very essential for um, a couple of different reasons. One is, you know, so much of this project is a, is, a, is a kind of quote unquote immigration project. And so what does it mean to create these kind of scenarios where, you know, England needs people from the empire to come during World War I, then it needs them to leave, right? The United States needs people to come from Latin America and, you know, during their Bracero moment that it needs them to leave, right? They're, 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 like the border is about this porous and yet deeply um, concrete barrier that has different meanings depending on where and when you're kind of plopping down in the story. So, you know, 1980s, 1990s Miami, which will wind up being the kind of tail end of this project, you know, which I, you know, where I grew up, um, you know, the border questions are obviously extraordinary, right? You have wet foot, dry foot policy. You've got, you know, this, this question of what to do with like, you know, the AIDS epidemic relative to like Haiti, right? I mean, all these questions are, are, are deeply embedded there. Um, and, you know, part of it is about, you know, I don't really see any parallels between the Latino story um, in say the Southwest or the West yet. Um, but I do know that, you know, what you have in part is this sense of like, you know, the immigrant narrative that is very, you know, critical and the, and the border as a place of kind of transcendence. Um, and it is going to be really necessary to maintain a kind of eye on immigration policy while also recognizing that when you're talking about um, Florida in the 1980s is going to be different than England in the 1940s, but not that different. And to, to, to the point about border policing, you know, the, the, the place that is still really invisible in this story is the Cayman Islands, right? So again, think about our Caribbean history of America, those numbers of, of incarcerated, that's about border policing in the Cayman Islands. It's, 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 it's literally a parallel story to what is, you, know, you see happening in Abu Dhabi and places in, in the Middle East, right? That are kind of concentrations of wealth. It's like Dominicans, it's Jamaicans, it's Haitians who are going to the Cayman Islands to participate in the offshore economy there, but their draconian immigration policy means they basically lock all these folks up. So it's, it's, it's a very um, zero tolerance immigration situation down there. So, you know, again, we don't, we don't tend to think about a, a humanitarian immigration crisis in the Caribbean, particularly not the Cayman Islands, but there it is, and and it, and it's part of what then shapes and what facilitates and what allows the Cayman Islands to be 
the attractive receptacle of offshore capital in the way that it is. And so that to me is, is a very useful way of kind of showing the fluidity of the immigration debate concurrently. So in, in the same way that there's a, a wet foot, dry foot policy that's going to get a lot of coverage, the actual like, you know, economic story that is, is really taking shape most dramatically is happening again, far from American audiences and from American debate. And so it's, it's in some ways you've offshored the immigration problem as much as you've offshored the money, you know, in, in a really kind of bizarre way, at least elements of the immigration problem, yeah. Um, Jean Paulo. So nice to see you, Nathan, first of all. Good to see you too, man. I, um, I was really tempted to start off with a joke about how universities that end with why you have global ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> why me? Why you? Right. <laughs> uh, anyways, it was, it was really wonderful. We miss you so much around here. Um, and I, I thought your talk was wonderful. And I thought it was really masterful in the way that... Uh, just as in, in the, the more, world more concrete book, you're able to have micro historical detail and nuance and big picture uh, kinds of narratives without one sort of crushing the other. It, it's really, you're, you're so good at that. Thank you. Um, so I, and I was really moved too by the, the personal kind of dimensions of the story. So I wanted to ask you, um, to, to, I wanted to ask you to reflect comparing this project to a world more concrete mm. uh, and how, how you decided to, you know, there's many, many of the thematics and many of the, your signature intellectual moves are there, um, but this is different and including the, this familial dimension. How did you get into this? How did you decide to do it this way? How, how did you evolve uh, in this direction? And, no, was anybody upset in your family that you were digging around, for example? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's a great question. Um, and uh, give me one second here. I feel like I wanted to, to pull up something. Um, that's all right. I didn't go down that slide. So, um, so many, many of the folks who are on the call who are uh, uh, alumni of my, of my racial literacy in the archive course, which I taught at, at NYU a few years ago, um, know that I'm not the first one to try to write a Connolly family history. Right. There's, act, there's actually already a, a book that is out there that was written by your colleague at NYU, Martha Hodes, in fact, the sea captain's wife. And the sea captain's wife follows the story of a woman named Eunice Stone, who uh, basically marries a, uh, she, she initially has a kind of, you know, ne'er-do-well husband and winds up, you know, in the South during the, the Civil War. And, and perhaps in Mobile, Alabama, she runs into a Caymanian sea captain. And they run off together and she lives the re remainder of her days in, in the Caribbean, in the Cayman Islands, and this whole big story. And when I was applying <laughs> to work um, with faculty potentially at NYU, in fact, I, I, I was a graduate student who had, who had applied, Martha Hodes had recognized my name, um, Connolly, and just asked me, she said, do you happen to be related to Rochelle Connolly? And I was like, oh yeah, that's my great grandmother. And so we ended up having this conversation, this is before the book even came out. And so my family was all excited, like, oh my goodness, someone's writing our family history. And then um, the book comes out, I want to say 2006, 2007, I'm already, you know, basically in grad school about to come out. And folks are like, you should totally write the sequel to The Sea Captain's Wife. You should, and I was like, nah, 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 I got this Miami project, it's going to be awesome, watch, wait and see, right? So I wasn't, I wasn't even trying to really deal with it. So it was only after a number of really impressive multi-generational family histories came out. And I'm thinking specifically about a book, obviously one is, is Martha's book, but also a book called Freedom Papers written by Jean Ebrard and Rebecca Scott. You know, this five generational um, incredible thing from like the Bight of Benin to Cuba, Haiti, New Orleans, Cozumel, I mean, it's all over the place. And like, no, all these different languages. Um, but I was like, yeah, this, this is a really impressive story. And I'll also say, Jean Paulo, that part of what inspired me to, to think about this as a research project just came from like barroom chatter I would have with friends while in grad school, like as you kind of get up to talking about your own family history. And so I would, you know, tell them about my research and they're like, oh, that's okay. And then I start talking biographically and they were like, oh, that's really fascinating. Like tell me more about this stuff. And so, you know, ultimately for me, I left the world more concrete feeling very unsatisfied. I, you know, I loved the book as written. I feel like it was a book that I wanted to write 
but there was a way in which the, the, the limits of my own archive and timetables and everything did not allow me to make the book as Atlantic as I wanted to make it. I, 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 when I saw Miami, I was like, this, this needs to be a way to do urban history in a frame that, that treats it as a Caribbean city and really does bring it into these bigger discussions of the Atlantic world. And, you know, you run into editorial culture, you run into a whole, whole host of things that kind of like change the project and you know, leave it transformed. And so there was a, a question of scale that I wanted to try to really advance upon and, and, and improve upon. And, and I felt that the best parts of a world more concrete for me were those sections where I could get away from talking abstractly about capitalism or urbanization or eminent domain or what have you, and simply show those dynamics at work in people's lives and in conversations. So for those who know the book you know, really well, like there, there are moments in the chapter that discusses, for instance, the expulsion at a neighborhood called Railroad Shop, where it gets really kind of detailed about the nature of the expulsion and the, the way in which people were thrown out in the rain and these conversations folks are having. Or there's a, there's a discussion between a father and a son, William Sawyer and, and, and his son, Junior, about like how one protects their investments because eminent domain is a constant threat, right? So those kinds of um, parables of loss between family members were very um, compelling to me, in some ways the most compelling element of that work. And so the way that I have you know, really come to understand this, this project is really as, as the second installment of a trilogy of books. Um, so World More Concrete is the first, Four Daughters is the second, and Black Capitalism is the, the third, which is like just a, a way of thinking about you know, this, this development of the American economy in the name of you know, advancing and profiting from the Negro problem. Like our, our economy is literally built on not just the creation of blackness, but on, on commodifying racism and finding ways to extract you know, resources from across um, society along, along the, that axis. So, so, so it, that's gonna be a much more kind of like skimming across the top, black capitalism, skimming across the top, um, you know, at, at thinking about kind of big patterns and changes and for daughters, is like, you know, the big kind of doorstoppy seven, 800 page like biography kind of like epic Atlantic thing. Um, and, it's, it's, and it's my way of, you know, really paying proper respect to what I see as the most challenging genre of historical writing to do, which is bio biography. Um, and, and again, to, to show just as, as, as you, you know, highlighted and, and, and I feel, you know, very um, encouraged by your response, you know, that it, it's, it's really necessary to, to take the abstraction out and show the experience of the economy and the experience of the politics and the experience of decolonization. Um, because I do think, and this was a bit of, of, of the shade that I, you know, folks who know me well, I tend to throw when, when, we, when we get abstract about like the question of neoliberalism is I feel like there, there's a very, historians in particular, I think that for whatever reason, because there's been a lot of terms that we've encountered over the years, but for whatever reason, that term is one that historians latched onto and decided they were going to like take that term back into the archives and kind of show doing what it's going to do, right? And I'm like, look, if you if you just think about how people are talking about this experience, like in the '70s, in the '80s, what 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 are they like when, when we're got, when we have our models and we're talking about you know mutual funds and the gas crisis and you know the evisceration of labor and all that stuff? What are people saying, right? And and to acknowledge the historicity of people experiencing the deregulatory moment, they're not gonna see it as a disjunction with the past. They're gonna see it as an extension of an earlier set of lived you know, principles and, and problems and, and, and you know, um, challenges. And, and so, so that for me is, is really integral is to be able to say, okay, let's put down the, 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 the analytic hardware for a minute and just actually talk about like what this means for, you know, a woman who can't afford to pay for her groceries or a, 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 a grandmother who has to liquidate her bank account so that she can pay for a suburban rehab facility. Or like, 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 like those are the ways that the, the capitalism question really makes, makes the most sense to me. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I guess, uh, it's, oh, last thing I'll say. So, so my grandfather, who again, as, as the talk you know, mentioned, struggled with manic depression his entire life. When he learned that Martha Hodes had written this book, 
he bought dozens of copies and we would find, you know, bundles of the book, you know, all over, you know, the house and in boxes and stuff would just show up and, you know, yeah, it was, it was, it was bad. And it was so important for the family to be, be able to say like, the, like someone wrote our family history. This is the story of our great, great grandmother. This is, you know, this whole thing that we can really kind of say we, we're here, right? This became a kind of holy relic, relic of sorts. And um, two quick things, you know, number one, um, the story of the sea captain's wife is not actually a blood relation. So once you read the book, you realize that we're not related to this woman. So there was a mythology about her being a blood relation that when you finally read the book, which I did when I taught it for the first time in the grad program, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Like this is not who we thought it was. That was the first thing. But then the second thing is absolutely people are concerned you know, because of you know, racial respectability, talking about things like mental health, drug addiction, loss of family wealth, right? These are things that are a challenge. At the same time, this makes folks historical and they kind of, they, they lean into that. They want to talk to me, right? So, so there, there's, there are conversations I've been having, you know, with family and, and thankfully my grandfather passed just last year, but I, I had the benefit of getting about 12 interviews with him, you know, extensive, um, you know, I've been interviewing folks, you know, pretty steadily. And, you know, these amazing things will happen where my mom will be telling me a story, for instance, about working at Centrus Bank. And it is, um, you know, a major player in the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. And the president of that bank, David Paul, um, was really quite corrupt. And, you know, his board of trustees did all kinds of, you know, double dealing. And my mother, who worked as the secretary to the board of trustees for Centrus Bank in Miami, Florida, was given instructions to shred all records of the board's proceedings. And she decided not to shred the records as, as the federal investigators basically kicked the door down. And she instead turned the, 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 the files over to the law enforcement and they proceeded to prosecute David Paul and send him to jail. And my mom's telling me the story and I'm just sitting there with my mouth kind of on the floor. And she's like, is this, is this like important? Is this like a, is this like a historically important thing? And I'm like, yeah, you, you actually brought down like one of the major bank presidents in this entire like episode. And she was like, oh, it's kind of like a revelation, you know, of sorts. But this is kind of how history happens, right? It's like, it's not historical until a historian comes around and starts asking about it. Um, and so, you know, part of what's been really fun about this is allowing my family to see themselves as situated in the history of prison education programs, which, you know, wax and wane, or the, or the, or the history of um, social welfare, or the history of financialization. And so that's, the, so they've been happy to, to be a part of that the aspect of it, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Nate. That was wonderful. Thanks. So, so I see, um, let me just, uh, okay. Yeah, Kim, I don't know if, if Kimani left his hand up or if he had a second question or not. You, you, you have a second question. Okay. So, so we'll let, we'll let Kim go and then, and then come on in after that. Yeah. Hey, Nathan. Good to see you. Johnson, how are you? Good. Um, so I have to say this is amazing and it, uh, just cover so many things in my own family history, so that's more of a comment. Um, mm -hmm. And the respectability politics and the fact that my grandmother mourned to her dying day the loss of her British citizenship. Mm. That was a huge thing for her. Right. Um, but I'm interested in, have you thought about, or do you mention the people who stayed? You know, like when I think about the relatives who stayed in the places where my, my folks were, at, you know, migrated from, um, because I'm thinking about the story of the 70s, Jamaica in the 1970s. Um, and so how do you sort of think about this moment of the 1970s, the people who stay? And I also, I think this sort of amazing sort of Caribbean sort of Pan-African sort of ferment and thought that's going on and sort of what role is that playing in this whole story of, of the Atlantic and migration? Um, mm. Yeah, no, this is, 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 is really good. Um, so, you know, this, this is, the, there, there are, like, my grandmother's father and many of her brothers, you know, some of them have land, some of them don't, you know, there, there's a sense that, that the family in and around Kingston, um, in particular, is, um, you know, kind of soldiering through, you know, the, the challenges of the 80s and, and 70s and the 80s. Um, but you know, there's also because we're, because we live in Miami, and this is this is the, the part of the project that kind of speaks to the, the the earlier work. You know, there's never really a a sense of like a a lost homeland or family members who are who are not 
present, right? I mean, th those who are familiar with South Florida know how, how much of a Caribbean space that is. And so there, there's a cycling through of you know, Jamaicans in Fort Lauderdale and in Miramar and in North Dade. Um, and, you know, there are people who, you know, have land in both places and all things. So there, there was, there was it's, a, it's a funny thing because my grandmother never really felt like by the time you got to like 88, 89, she didn't feel like it was safe enough to go back. So there's a discourse of crime in Jamaica in particular, where it's like, I can't go back. I worry about, you know, I had relatives who were, who were murdered there. And so therefore I, it's, it's unsafe. We're not going to go back there. It feels really sad to me. Um, so that, so that, that's an element of it, but I, I have not yet documented on the Jamaican front, um, the family members who, you know, are still there and who have, you know, land holdings there and to what extent, um, you know, they are, um, feeling wed to the place. The, the, the plan, this, this was supposed to be the season to, for me to do the research in Jamaica. And obviously for all kinds of reasons, you know, everything has been kind of like remote now. Um, but I, I finally felt like I had enough of the British story and the US story pinned down to be able to say, okay, let me do now the field work and really kind of, you know, round that out. So that's, that's still to be done from a, a field work and archival stand, standpoint, but it, it is, uh, to, to, to your, you know, point about highlighting within the talk itself, I, I'm, I'm, striving to tell the Jamaican the Cayman stories in particular together because there, there's, a, there's a way in which those two are locked in this relationship where there's a, a point counterpoint discussion between them. We were in the Cayman Islands in 2014, oh no, 2016, and um, visiting with the family down there and doing research in the Cayman Islands and doing interviewing in the Cayman Islands. And that's an extraordinary place precisely along the lines that you highlight about just thinking through kind of the, the, the ferment of whether it's black nationalism or pan-Africanism or, you know, crit or critical Marxism. I was University of West Indies is a really important hub for this kind of thought through the 70s. Um, and, and, for, and for those who are um, think, interested in, in, in reading more about this, I encourage you to look at David Scott's interviews in Small Acts with like Rupert Lewis and Bobby Hill. I mean, there's a bunch of people who are, you know, these like hundred page, you know, inter interviews that David Scott does with like leftists and you know in Jamaica in the seventies that are really incredible. So that that's my sense of that of that moment primarily, you know, as, as the project is taking shape. But but one of the things that has been fascinating to consider is when I when I interview and talk to the folks in the Cayman Islands. I guess I shouldn't be completely surprised, but it's a very fiscally conservative right-wing predisposition politically, right? But this is not, what, what, what's the language that, that my cousin used down there? Um, this, this, this is not a place that's um, a tax haven, it's tax neutral. They have, like, they have these, these euphemisms that they use to describe like how they've built this offshore situation. Um, and- they listen to country music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 you no. Know, Cayman is a red state, right? Let's, 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 put it, let's put it that way. So, so it's it's extraordinary because you know, and and having gone back and now and done some reading around, like you know, students who are from Guyana or from Trinidad or from Jamaica who are showing up in the Black Power moment, how the British government is responding, like they're you know very zero tolerance, sending like actual warships to the Cayman Islands to, to tamp down. On militancy in, in that particular location. So there's so there's all this thing, there's a reactionary Caribbean. There's a reactionary Caribbean that I'm now beginning to stitch together. Like, you know, Walter Rodney was killed in the Caribbean. Like it, it, like, like these, these are important pieces to, to put, stitch together because when I was coming through grad school, you know, we read Winston James, or you read about, you know, the the militant black workers in the Panama Canal zone. Like, like these, these are the things that you you kind of ingested. And so there, there was a discourse about Caribbean militancy without necessarily rounding out and saying, let's talk about Caribbean reactionary politics and, and what, is it, what does it mean to have this place of empire that is governed you know, in, in very imperial ways. And my grandmother, you know, may, may she rest in peace. I mean, she was not a radical, right? She was, not, she was somebody who had a picture of the, of the queen on her bookshelf till the day that she died, right? I mean, you know what you know of what I speak. And, 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 when, and when my grandfather had his manic episodes, the way that he exhibited his mania in this household was by putting on dashikis and calling himself Ras Biko II, right? So he became a Pan-Africanist as a way of exhibiting 
you know, insanity, right? Um, and so that, that again, it's that it's that kind of interplay where um, you know there there there's much about the diaspora that is going to be an extension of less than you know progressive you know politics, but it's still a Caribbean story, right? And so, and so for me, it's it's a it's a very rich relationship between you know the kind of deregulatory you know financializing you know ideology that arrives in the Caribbean and what what then becomes of that in a kind of family narrative sense and then what also ends up being for those folks who are like in exile in in America I feel like they, for whatever reason the black power experiment failed in the Caribbean independence failed and so we're now living in the U.S. as a way you know we vote Democrat but we have very you know different kinds of relationships with what black self-determination kind of means. Uh, Kimani. Um, yeah, so this is actually based on what you were kind of getting at. Um, so originally I thought of this when my, you were answering Michael's question, thinking about the detention in Grand Cayman with immigrants coming from like Jamaica and Dominican Republic, and specifically how the Atlantic and the Caribbean transformed after um, independence in the 60s and 70s and how like Cayman kind of became like this boundary um, where empire is kind of protected. And also we see like what you're saying with finance um, capital being protected. But I also want to add on to that, thinking about how like Jamaica in, the, in of itself and like this, the reactionary politics are kind of like pushed onto these nations and thinking about how, like you were saying, it, like black politics and black revolution kind of fails in the independence moment. And you have these governments that eventually rise up due to Reagan and various US politicians that are very right wing or US like centric instead of being more British centric, but are very anti leftist, anti anything progressive or radical. And so I guess I would just want you to, if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and if it relates to your work, because I find this really interesting, like the connection between protecting capital and Cayman and barring who could enter because of connections to the empire, but also like this kind of like this right wing threat train of thought that kind of like exists even to this day in the Caribbean that's indebted to the IMF and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, Edward Siaga becomes a, a really important champion of, you know, conservative politics in the island. And, you know, again, and he's, <laughs> you, you get you get some old Jamaicans around the patio with, with some drinks in them and they start talking about, you know, PNP and PBP and, the, and these political parties and their, their conflicts um, and uh, certain households have certain kind of affinities. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's 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 the kind of question that I think in some ways um, just starts first with an acknowledgement that, you know, these places, you know, in the Caribbean are extraordinarily dynamic politically. They're places where the U.S. is, is obviously fighting all kinds of proxy struggles up until the present day. Um, and because of, particularly in Jamaica, the conversion to this kind of tourist economy, you know, post the, the arrival of Bob Marley as a global figure and the redefinition of this island, um, you know, it's going to create these extraordinary, um, extraordinarily draconian policing practices, carceral practices, like, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a just, a, it's a very stratified place. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's one of those perfect examples. And again, I know this from the Miami work, you know, where you can create an image of idyllic kind of coastal affluence, but it's all being held together by violence, right? And, and, and it's a kind of violence that isn't simply about like lump and proletariat gun battles in the street, but it's about state-sponsored violence exacerbating these conflicts in order to in some ways displace the more extractive elements of the economic situation. And so, you know, it isn't, it isn't much more complicated, at least for the answer to just say that like, Jamaica's attempt to maintain a level of visibility as the, you know, means of national um, uh, reproduction and growth and, you know, employment are changing. The, I, don't, I don't know, there's a really great um, book that just came out by Jovan Lewis, an anthropologist who's at UC uh, Berkeley. Um, actually, give me one second. Uh, I'm blanking on the, one second, um, what would it be shot up for David? Scammer's Yard, so the, 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 the Crime of Black Repair in Jamaica by Jovan Scott Lewis, um, Scammer's Yard, and, um, you know, it's basically about this cell phone, mail order, 
online scam, you know, in, in infrastructure that emerges when, again, in the, in the lack of certain kinds of employment. Um, and so, you know, there are, I think, a lot of ways to make sense of the consequences of conservatism in a story of like, you know, the Caymanian offshore and the kind of, you know, underground economy of a place like Jamaica. For me, what, what's, what's still to be kind of explored is like to what extent even those public projections are actually quite muddled, right? So in, 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 the, in, the, in the sense of that both Jamaica and Cayman, if they, if they both have these kind of rigid political regimes, to what extent are both of them relying on informal economies, both of them relying on offshore, you know, monies? I mean, that to me is going to be at least one of the bigger, the bigger questions to, to figure out. But, um, but yeah, man, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very thorny story in the sense that, you know, I'm trying to basically the way, the way the story is going to end is back in Cayman in, you know, the 21st century around like Airbnb um, and, you know, in, encountering the, the archive, my great grandfather's papers, I, I literally came into contact with them while my family and I were renting this like empty seaside mansion in the Cayman Islands, right? And, and so we are there as a family reunion. Um, and, you know, clearly I'm grasping at material and I'm going to the National Archive and I'm doing these other things in, in the Cayman, Cayman Islands archive. And there, like the archive comes to me by way of this family reunion and it's found like in this empty husk of like, you know, financialization. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, um, again, just the, the whole point of being both intimate, but on a, on a large scale, I mean, the extent to which I can do some of that work on the question of conservatism and household politics and, and the island, I'm very invested in trying to capture that as well, so. Uh, uh, Natalia. Yes, thank you um, very much, Professor Connolly. Um, I actually had a question um, regarding this last part you just mentioned about finding these papers um, in this house. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the household not only as uh, the place that needs to be sustained, and you mentioned this uh, practices of juggling precarity uh, that you um, um, that you were analyzing th throughout your, your family history, but also the household as the center of what you have called like this intergenerational learning, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, so it is a, a place that makes uh, both uh, more traditional institutionalized uh, historical papers uh, to create this historicity, but also uh, this more intangible um, and more, we can say, uh, not only physical, but also corporal knowledge uh, mm -hmm. that passes through the family. So I was wondering if throughout your research, you have also um, thought about thinking about the archive or, or uh, alternative ways to think uh, uh, this combination of different materialities, different documents, uh, the precedence and genealogies of where have you found these documents as, as part of your research and of creating this uh, more, I don't know, um, effective dimension of, of, of an archive. Uh, yeah, yeah no, ab absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, I've given uh, at least one paper about just the methodology around this work. Um, and, and the title of, of that paper is of some variation of a demented archive. Um, and, you know, the, the, the use of that word demented is obviously meant to capture the insanity of colonialism. Um, and, you know, there, there's a certain illusion to the rigid, rigid indexing that goes on under the British colonial system, you know, where, where you have these, these, these volumes that are you know, perfectly preserved and bound and, you know, letters are sewn in and they have tables of contents and all of that. So, so there's, a, there's a kind of conceit to that ordering. Um, but then there's also the fact that the archive from which a lot of this is coming is depending on people who have shaky mental health, right? So, so how, do, how do you interview somebody who has manic depression? How do you get an oral history from somebody who has Alzheimer's? Um, you know, and, and what does it mean to, you know, try to capture this drifting memory, you know, in real time? I have a box upstairs of tapes that my grandfather, you know, bought over the years of, you know, self-help, get rich quick, this, that, and the third, um, but over which he would then tape versions of his own manifestos. Right, so, so the tape itself has got combinations of, you know, um, Earl Nightingale or the, you know, 
um, get rich quick stuff, um, Tony Robbins, and then it will have like him quoting Oscar Wilde at length, right? De Profundis or something like, th like that. Like that is part of this archive that I have to basically make sense of. So, and, it, and it's also an archive that is slipping through my fingers in the sense of going back to the, the point I raised about, you know, an, a, an envelope shows up to that, to that family reunion and it's not there for no reason. Right, to be clear, like the, the, the whole reason that we've kept family papers that include wills and letters and you know drafting documents and survey documents is because those archival documents are there for making a particular kind of claim in a crazy speculative offshore situation, right? So, so the, again, the question of capitalism creates an archive that then will be part of this qualitative humanistic study, but it, it, those two things are not disentangled, right? So, so me as a researcher, like I have to actively think about the extent to which my family members want me to assist them in clarifying and clearing the deed on these hundred acres in the Cayman Islands, while also telling the story about the Atlantic world, right? So this, so this is the insanity <laughs> of, of, of the whole thing. And to be able to capture, just as, as, as you pointed out, the, the affective nature of this work I mean, there are earlier versions of this, you know, I gave, you know, talks on this maybe three, four years ago, where I'd find myself like misting up with tears when I would re refer to my grandmother who had passed or, you know, and thinking about the, the question of, you know, shame and respectability and how I, you have to handle those, those questions very seriously and sensitively. Um, and they had an extraordinary conference at Tufts last year about family history. And one of the big takeaways, just as a, as a, as a kind of methodological rule of thumb, is that you should basically research and write about everybody as if they're a member of your family, right? With, with, with that kind of care. So, so not, not to be heroic or hagiographical, but to, to, to talk about warts and all, and to really, you know, not, don't, don't spend your time being polemical, think about what it means to, to understand them as a three-dimensional person with, with three-dimensional concerns and finite horizons of knowledge and all the rest of it. Um, so it, it, it has been very important and, and, and really um, from the outset uh, essential to be able to write about and think through the nature of the archival work itself. And this actually to an earlier question um, that Jean Paulo raised, you know, one of, one of the legacies of the first book was recognizing or really coming to learn just how segregated the archives were in Miami as an, as like an urban space. Like I, I couldn't write that book unless I physically crossed color lines and did different kinds of, of, of research. Um, but then also recognizing that the archival empirical method is deeply limited, um, profoundly limited in terms of what it can answer. And that there's always gonna be an element of this that is you know, gonna be about field work. It's gonna be speculative. It's going to be, um, I mean, particularly if, if I never get to the bottom of my great grandfather's like seduction crime, right? It, it's okay because in, in some ways that gray space is it perfectly captures the the dynamic that I want to convey, right? Which is which is it's about narrative reinvention, and that and that, and that is a, that is a feature of like modernity, the way which we, we with our utterances and with our letters and with our respectability we can fashion these these people, um, and that to me is is can only really be done if you take a reflective position about the nature of the, of the archive and archival work.